Here we are, YouTube. Thanks for joining in. We have a cozy setting in the center of Paris. Any religious background at all for you? Well, like everybody, I was born with no religion, um, but I was lucky enough to be brought up in a religiously neutral household. Um, my father was an Anglican, but pretty much lapsed by the time I came along, and I think called himself an agnostic when I was a child. I'm working on him to move him over. And uh, my mother was just not terribly interested in religion. She wasn't religious herself, but um, I lived in a household where religion really wasn't much of a topic of discussion, and it was pretty much left up to me. I think my parents would have supported me no matter what I decided, but from the time that I was old enough to understand what religion is, I knew that it didn't make any sense. So, right. yeah. for me, being an atheist uh, was not something I set out to be, but it's a very natural outcome of not being indoctrinated into anything. It is indeed, yes, but I would say that oftentimes you would represent the demographics of people, you know, who it, it never affected me, so why, why would I, you know, get involved in it? Certainly, President of Atheist Alliance International. <laughs> so, what provoked that move? Why did you decide to become an activist? <laughs> well, I think the why uh, is probably the same reason that a lot of people people do things, it's because I want to make the world a better place. Religion is a huge problem in our society. It's dangerous, it's used as a basis for discrimination against people, it's used to support laws and attitudes that harm people, it is absurd and it's dangerous, and it's all done under this cloak of privilege that religion gets, this level of respect it gets simply for being religion. Um, it's not warranted mm -hmm. and it's damaging to our society, so I want to make our society better. So there's all kind of different ways. Um, but you chose atheism as a cause. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not the only not-for-profit work that I do, but it certainly is the majority of not-for-profit work that I do. Um, I guess it's, to some extent, it found me. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, AAI decided to expand its convention program outside the US, and it approached the Atheist Foundation of Australia to co-host what became the very successful Global Atheist Convention in Melbourne last year. And that happened to be in my hometown, mm -hmm. uh, and they were looking for people to be on a committee, and so I ended up on the committee. So to some extent, the, oppor uh, the opportunity came to me, but I think this is a really important area. I think it's an overlooked area by a lot of people. Uh, it doesn't have the same profile as something like a Greenpeace, um, and I find it intellectually very interesting. Is it sort of more international outside of the Anglo-Saxon world, the English-speaking world, do you think? I mean, there are platforms in different countries, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I have a fear, I was saying to someone recently that, um, as you see reflected even on YouTube, that um, it's very much an English language thing, it's the States, Britain, Ireland, Australia, but the Anglo-Saxon world, basically. Uh, are we, do you, I mean, here you are in France, I mean, are there... <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are uh, atheist organisations in France, but, I mean, actually one of the things I've been doing recently is talking to people who want to set up atheist groups around the world. That's, that's one of the roles that we play, is giving advice to people and support. I've been talking to people in Israel, people in Lebanon, people in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and it is fantastic to see atheism branching out, outside the more traditional markets. Mm -hmm. uh, from a communications perspective, I think, um, if the English language certainly does dominate, and that's partly maybe because some of the most well-known authors have been published at least first in English and then translated into other languages, and their natural speaking language yeah. is English. Um, but you know, the issues that we are facing affect everybody. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter where you live. And in fact, um, there's people in uh, parts of the world where English is not the dominant language. They've got some serious problems with religion and yeah. need our support. We actually just started translating our newsletters into Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, so we're now publishing them in two languages. And I think, you know, from an English speaker's perspective, it is very easy to just get comfortable. Yeah. I mean, for example, the AI board is international. We've got 11 people. Yeah. Uh, around the world in seven different countries, but we communicate in English, and yeah. frankly, that's because of people like me who are native English speakers who aren't uh, terribly conversant in anything else. But I think it's great that we have got people on the board who can speak other languages. So um, we recently put our membership form into French, mm -hmm. and we've now Spanish is on the way, and yes, our newsletter is going out in Spanish as well. Look, certainly, let me put in a plug. Anybody who wants to translate things for us into other languages, well, just absolutely. get in touch. And I'm saying the same thing, anyone out there. I'm eh? français, a bit in Deutsch, schwei schwei Arabe, Espanol, if anyone would like to. Atheism, humanism, semantics, and titles. What do you see as the difference? In this? <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of overlap, and there's a lot of things that atheists and humanists, the titles that people choose to identify themselves are certainly less important than what they do. Yeah. I think the, the title of atheist is generally used, particularly in conjunction with the so-called new atheism, yeah. uh, to be more outspoken, more assertive, more willing to challenge religion on its absurdities, yeah. whereas the humanist title is seen as more accommodating, more putting humanism up as, as an alternative to religion 
And it's true that atheism is an alternative to religion, but it's an alternative in the sense that it's the complete opposite yeah. <laughs> as opposed to one in a series. Mm. I, I think of it, I guess, I always try to describe atheism when people say it's just another religion. I try to say, well, think of it like a TV channel. You've got the Christian channel and the Judaism channel and the Muslim channel and so forth. Atheism isn't a channel. Atheism is turning the television off and thinking yeah. for yourself. <laughs> um, you might say in this context humanism is a bit more like a channel. Mm. I mean, it's still, it's still a non-theistic approach to life, mm. but it is a bit more like a set of principles and things like that. Atheism doesn't tell you what to think. It mm. just tells you to think. Mm. Well, actually, it, I spoke to the IHEU at their congress. Uh, I was there in, um, in Oslo in August, yeah. and they said they sometimes receive applications for funding from people and say, oh, we're humanists, but they sign off, you know, yours in God or yeah, something like that. Okay. It's like, you don't really seem to get the Good point. point. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, we're all humans, yeah, but that's not yeah. quite the same thing. I just prefer atheists because it makes it clear, um, you know. The um, reason I prefer atheists is actually what, you're right, what I said in Dublin. Religious privilege is a massive problem in yeah. our society. There's this respect that goes along with the idea of simply being religious. You don't do anything to deserve it. In fact, you do a lot to not deserve it, but yeah. you get this respect uh, from our society and, unfortunately, from our lawmakers. Atheism is the stance that most explicitly rejects the privilege. It just says, no, there mm -hmm. is no religion, and that's fine. I don't need you. I can think for myself, and I'm going to live my life on a rational basis. Mm. Um, humanism comes across as softer. In addressing the whole point, um, the two camps, you know, and the American side, the great dilemma, of course, is the abuse of the First Amendment and separation of church and state and the Bible Belt and creationism and all that sort of thing there. Um, here in Europe, um, I have colleagues even in the House in, in Parliament who say, what are you talking about, Randall? There's no, you know, I mean, it's a generally secular place and all the rest of it. Um, and, and Catholicism certainly is not creationist, and, and, and all the Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran churches are, have all accepted Darwin and all that. However, um, we do have an increasing Muslim population, and I, I know it's only 0 .006 of uh, mm -hmm. the thing, uh, of the population, but uh, many of them are creationists, some of them are, and some of them aren't, but it's that whole intransigence that where we kind of had won a battle of secularism in Europe, so there's a little fear. Sort of. <laughs> no, I, I know, I'm not, I'm not a provocateur, I'm not, but it is an issue, you know, and um, I've made this point to members, and you can see the strict laws here where Sarkozy banned the burqa, yep. Even, regardless of the numbers. Yeah, yeah. He did it it's a set of principles. It is a set of principles and all that, and we are up against it. I don't know, that's a huge question. But what do you feel about that? Have you been exposed to that at all here in France? Um, well, I haven't in France, um, mm. but I know it's certainly a problem in France, and it's a problem in Australia as well. I, I think it's going to be a problem. It's certainly a problem in the UK. Yeah. Um, I think the only way you can really tackle something like that is education, because by the, if, if people come from another country to somewhere and they come as a refugee, yeah. um, a lot of them will cling to the culture and the religion that they grew up in and they need to, I think as an immigrant you need to appreciate the values of the country that you've come to, the value of one of the big strengths of France is its secularism mm. and you are allowed to be Muslim here, there's nothing wrong with you, that's, right, that's yeah. how you want to spend your time, I think it's yeah. ridiculous personally but if that's how you want to spend your time that's yeah. fine. I think the best chance is the education system and education obviously should be compulsory for children, they should be brought up in a multicultural, um, secular and tolerant education system. Mm -hmm. The idea of faith schools, mm -hmm. um, which are, which do exist in France, um, mm -hmm. they're predominantly Catholic here, but in principle if faith schools exist, there's no reason why some, one day someone won't go and have a Muslim school, mm -hmm. and that's what's happened in the UK, certainly. I don't support them at all. Mm -hmm. These are children. Mm -hmm. People are not allowed to vote until they're 18. They're not little left-wing people or little right-wing people. The idea is that they get taught how yeah. to think, they yeah. grow up and they yeah. think about things and they make up their own minds, and then when they're 18 they can vote. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that people, children are segregated um, on the religion of their parents, it's not even their religion. They're not, they're not even old enough to understand what religion yeah. is <laughs> at the time people so, were trying to segregate them, yeah. and they're being parceled up into little social groups where not only will they not learn about the option of not being religious or all the other religions that are out there, it doesn't promote a happy, tolerant, um, pluralistic kind of society, which mm. is, I think, the society we, we would actually would all like to live in. And indeed, it's a society that's going to be stable and productive in the long run. Mm. If we had a system where children were not indoctrinated in religion um, at, in their childhood, mm -hmm. but simply allowed to grow up, taught how to think, um, and then if they chose to become religious as adults, that was accepted in a, in a secular society, the world would be a lot peaceful and you wouldn't have these kinds of mm. ghettos as well. I mean, people may choose, presumably as adults, to become a Muslim and never marry an mm. atheist, um, and that's mm. obviously their choice, um, but I still think society would be an awful lot better. 
but I think the best way to tackle it is through education and also through the promotion of the kinds of values that attract people to but, come to countries like these, which yeah. is the secularism and the tolerance. Yeah. But sure, I mean, I, we live in hope. I'm, what would I say? From we, have, we have to live in hope. <laughs> yeah. The only other option is to live in despair and just give up. Indeed. I'll tell you this. I'm Irish, and the reason I say that is because, as an Irishman, my country represents a very long history of diaspora. Um, and the Irish have integrated very well and weren't accepted in many countries because mm -hmm. they were Catholic. Mm -hmm. They may be white, they may have spoken English, but they weren't accepted because it was, you know, it was, especially in the United States. I'm just saying we integrated, so we're kind of the authority on integrating. <laughs> You'll find an Irish bar anywhere in the world. <laughs> well, actually, my partner is from Irish descent, and yeah. it's true. I mean, he's, he was raised Catholic, although he isn't Catholic anymore. And he does say that when he had a girlfriend at sort of high school age, yeah. uh, the fact that he was Irish Catholic was a problem for the father of the girlfriend. Yeah. And he was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, by that stage, I think he'd pretty much given up on religion anyway. Sure. But I think, it I think it takes a couple of generations. I mean, Australia is certainly a product of an immigrant culture. Um, and we had a lot of waves of you know, Greek and Italian immigrants after the Second World War, Vietnamese in the 70s, and now we do have a lot of people coming in from African countries in particular, mm. uh, as well as plenty of other places. Mm. And it seems to be one or two generations, but that's not going to work if people stay in ghettos, yes. like you say. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's not the kind of world I think any of us want to live in. But the wall, exactly, well, I think we're on the same page, Annie, but the, as I insist, the wall of that ghetto is Islam, because it's, it's mm. just, you cannot mix it. I, as I say, if the Muslim guy can date my sister, okay, I want the same equality. Sure. I want to date his sister, even though I'm not. You know, and if that if it doesn't work like that way, there is going to be a problem. Yeah, I think so. It's I, that, it's I, that simple. I completely agree. In that, the Irish... And in the problem with you know, whether it's Islam or a fundamentalist Christian who has the same kind of ridiculous attitude, um, look, faith is not based on logic. I mean, yeah. we all know that. So attacking it with logic and rationality, which basically comes back to we want the world to be happy and productive and we'll all get along a whole lot better if you don't hold these ridiculous beliefs against everybody. Yeah. Uh, I agree, Islam is the problem. Yeah. Uh, or, or the religion is the problem. In this particular, religion is the problem. It could be applied, and it was applied stringently in Ireland between, you know, I mean, relations between Catholics and Protestants. What about relationships between so Jews and Arabs in uh, yeah, Israel yeah. and Palestine? I mean, mm -hmm. Islam is not the only problem, but it, it's any religion that people take so seriously yeah. um, to the extent that it colours their entire life. And this is part of the issue about religion, Islam being so much more mm. than just praying five times a day towards Mecca mm. and, sure. and things like that. It's a whole way of life that yeah. doesn't that yeah. doesn't let you integrate yeah. with and the rest of society. And I agree, it's a huge yeah. problem. And it's non-negotiable. And it's doesn't it seem to be negotiable? And that's the whole point. Until I hope you're right there. I hope that you know it's about chipping away. I rather hope that you know. Uh, I see. Uh, I live in Brussels. Uh, a large population of uh, North Africans, they're Muslims as well, Islamists, whatever. And, um, you know, it's interesting, the younger generation, the girls, are very confused about it, you know, so, mm. so they still have some kind of head cover, you understand? They're uh, slipping backwards. But, 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 but it's just like a walk in pharmacy of Chanel products on her yeah. face for makeup, do you know what I mean? And downstairs and as well. tight clothes. It's just, yeah, just to try to, it's kind of, it like they're exposed look, to everything it, else. It must be really hard. I mean, I, I feel know. sympathy for people. Who, I mean, you'd far rather be in that situation than being brought up in Africa and not have the kind of opportunities that you have in Brussels. But I feel really sorry for people who are brought up in that. They're under a huge amount of parental pressure. They're under a huge amount of peer pressure probably as well. Um, unfortunately, one of the few ways or the few ways the state can provide a structure is actually the education system. And I guess that's why I come back to it. Mm. I don't know. If there, look, if there was a silver bullet, if this was easy, mm. we would have done it. Yeah. Um, it's not easy because, like you say, we're up against, fighting against Islam. We're fighting against people's entrenched views about how the world works, mm. which are based on a book written a couple of <laughs> thousand years ago that sense. makes no sense. sense well, right. But if that's all you've ever been taught, it takes a long time to unhardwire that in your head. Mm -hmm. um, so the best we can do as a society is to not demonise people no, who no, no, are no, religious, not. obviously, but to not give their ideas that are not based on logic any quarter. It's like, that's what you do in your private life? Well, we're going to give you an education that prepares you properly for the world, that doesn't teach you um, that you know, people were created the way the Quran says we were created, that actually teaches you about evolution and teaches you about how the planets work and how old the universe actually is. We're not going to accept that in our education system. 
and hopefully a proportion of that generation will think yeah. and they will appreciate the, the value of critical thinking and apply it. Will it get everybody? No. Honestly, it probably won't. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, you're looking for a tolerant and multicultural society where at least no one's demonised or persecuted mm -hmm. for their beliefs and then trying it the next generation. It's a really long, slow process. Yeah. Um, you know, am I hopeful? Look, on average, overall I am, because the world is gradually moving in that direction. There are certainly big pockets of resistance to it, but if you look at how the world has moved over the last couple of hundred years, you know, obviously we had an enlightenment. Islam certainly needs to have an enlightenment. Um, we are generally moving in the right direction. I mean, we have logic, we have reason, we have facts on our side. Religion cannot say that. Um, none of the religions can say that. And I have to, I guess, if I have faith in anything, and I don't really do faith, but if I was going to have faith in anything, it would be in, in humans yeah. uh, and their ability to, yeah. as a collective group over time, reason and progress. That is indeed the only thing that got us out of the caves, I presume. Do you have any problem headhunting? Perhaps that's an unfortunate term. <laughs> headhunting um, uh, VIP atheists or, well, anyway, attendees to, to take part and to speak and, and how does that work? Um, I think the what is really good about this community is the, the willingness of people to contribute. I mm -hmm. mean, people like Richard Dawkins, P.C. Myers, uh, Tasleem Nazra and I and her Seali, all these people who are willing to give their time uh, mm. to speak at uh, fantastic events for the cause of, of atheism and secularism. Um, it's getting in their diaries, it seems to be the problem, because they're mm. so good that they're in, in great demand. Sure. Um, I mean, we have very good communications with them and we've certainly helped um, get them for various conventions, including the Dublin one and the, the Cologne one next year. But mm -hmm. um, I think lots of people try and get hold of them. Does someone get a free um, airline ticket or a hotel room at least out of it or something like that? Uh, or? The costs are covered to attend. The costs are covered. Yeah, usually. Okay. But That's no fee as such. Um, I wouldn't say it's never been done, but it's pretty rare. I mean, most yeah. of these people are willing to donate their time simply for the simply for the cause, and they recognise. Yeah. I mean, these conventions are not run with big budgets in mind. I mean, we always seek to make a profit because mm -hmm. it's not like there's a whole lot of money in atheism sure. to fund these things, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but you know, look, it's fantastic the amount of work that's done. Yeah. Uh, and Conventions are all, and it's not just the speakers. I mean, the amount of organisation that goes into convention is enormous. And each of the teams, you have the team in Ireland, the team in mm. Cologne, the team in Australia for next year, um, it's a group of dedicated volunteers yeah. um, who are just doing it to try and make the world better. So I think it's fantastic. It's such a great sense of camaraderie. Religion thrives on donations mm -hmm. constantly, and people don't think twice about it how yep. much or how little or nothing and our you tax put on dollars. the place. Yeah, <laughs> and tax dollars also. Why, do, why is it because it's atheism? You, you can see that videos cost money and time. Yep. You can see publications that you kind of feel bad about asking anyone to give something, you know? Yeah, I suppose, but. On the other hand, if you want things to happen, things, yeah. don't, things don't happen for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the downsides uh, to all this independent thinking and no rules in atheism is that atheists do tend to be not great joiners of groups. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the reality is that we rely on our members and donate, donators mm -hmm. to, to survive. We mm -hmm. couldn't survive without the money, even with all the free work that me, the entire board is a board of volunteers. We have lots of other volunteers who help us. Um, but if people could support us, then we could do more. I mean, yeah. th that is one of our big limitations. It costs money to put on conventions. It costs money to run educational programs. Um, it costs money to do billboard campaigns and, 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 and all, all kinds of advocacy work, and we could do more if people donate. So consider that a plug. Please support <laughs> AI as a member or a donator, as a donor through our website. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it is a big problem, and I don't know if we'll ever... Um, <laughs> You'll never fix that one, but um, you feel we're making progress anyway, do you? Yeah? You feel you are? But overall, I, I'm optimistic. I look at what's happened, say, in the last five years where the so-called new atheism has really taken off. I don't think we've ever been in a stronger position. That doesn't mean that mm. we're not up against it. You know, religion is a well-funded, very powerful lobby group, and people don't give up power easily. These are people who are entrenched in their view that they've got some kind of divine <laughs> right and divine knowledge that they, as opposed to all the other religions, are right. And people don't give that up, that this privileged place that they have in society. So we're up against it, but we've got reason on our side, we've got evidence, we've got facts, we've got logic, mm. and we have to not be afraid to use them and not be apologetic about calling religion out on its absurdities. Absolutely. Since I'm in France, <laughs> I go off on a major tangent, <laughs> I'll quote Napoleon, when Marshall Ney said to him once, he said, we'll do X and Y and Z tomorrow, sire, God willing. 
And Napoleon turns to him brusquely and says, God, God has nothing got to do with it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> At least he was honest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you can sit around and pray, or you could actually get up and do something useful. So you tell me that the uh, next convention is in Cologne in Germany. The next European convention the is European Cologne convention. in Germany, 25th to 27th of May. There are in fact four AAI conventions next year. There's Cologne, Germany, Melbourne, Australia, yeah. Kamloops in BC, Canada, and Manila in the Philippines. So no matter what country you're in, <laughs> you should be get going to at there. least one atheist convention next year. Just off your passport year. or get a passport <laughs> yeah, if you don't that's have right. one. <laughs> go, to, go to all four of them, they'll be great. I'm going to three of them. It's going to be great. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. Tanya, thank you so much. It's been a no real problem. pleasure. Great to talk to you. Okay.